Now, it is well known that history is written, always written, by the victors. And they will write history from their particular class point of view. This book, on the other hand, is based upon the actual truth, the actual experience of a whole generation, thousands upon thousands of people, men and women and young people, people without a name. In the history books you will read names after names of kings and prime ministers and generals and presidents and dictators. You will never re read the names of the real authors, the real protagonists of this story. I knew these people. I knew them personally. And they were, believe me, they were giants. <coughs> Ordinary working class people. <coughs> people without a formal education living under the most extreme difficulties, who were prepared to sacrifice and did sacrifice their livelihood, their freedom, their health, and in many cases their lives in this titanic struggle. But what we have here, in effect, is <clears throat> a hidden history. It is a history that has been buried Yes, buried along with tens of thousands of corpses that lie under the green fields and olive groves of that wonderful country which is Spain. Now, many of you, I think, many people who have studied Marxism and studied history from a Marxist point of view, will at least be more or less acquainted with the, the history of the Spanish Revolution, that marvelous revolution <clears throat> of the 1930s, when Leon Trotsky said, the Spanish working class would be capable of making not one revolution, but 10 revolutions. And if they did not f succeed in the last analysis, it wasn't any of their fault. What more could you ask of the Spanish workers and peasants and youth more than what they did in those marvelous revolutionary years to change society. Yes, they gave their all. If they did not succeed, the problem was not with them. The problem was with the leadership or the lack of leadership, lack of leadership or more correctly, bad leadership on the part of all of the mass organizations of the working class from the anarchists through the socialists to in particular the Stalinists who played an absolutely pernicious role. But that's not the subject of tonight, tonight's discussion. There's a very good book by Felix Morrow, which you can read, which will give you all the information you need to know. Yes, but people know something about this. But how many people in this room know anything or knew anything about what happened subsequently after 1939, when Franco marched his uh, fascist hordes into Madrid in 1939, <clears throat> was that the end of history? It wasn't the end of history for, for the Spanish working class. You think the clock stopped in 1939? Of course it did not. You know, how many people, here's a question for you to consider, how many people were killed in the Spanish Civil War against fascism and the Republic? How many people were killed? Well, I can't answer that question. Nobody can answer that question. I've seen estimates from anything from a quarter of a million to one million. And it's impossible to say. I guess the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. Somewhere, somewhere approximately half a million people were slaughtered, butchered, killed in that uh, terrible conflict. Yes, but the, the slaughter, the butchery, the tortures, the imprisonments, the concentration camps did not end in 1939, quite the opposite. Franco took a terrible revenge on the Spanish working class. Tens of thousands of people were shot without trial. They are buried, as I say, all over Spain. You know, the next time you go on holiday to that wonderful country, which I encourage you to do, it's a beautiful country, my second home. Yeah, you'll find it's a, it's a, Spain is a beautiful country, beautiful mountains, beautiful olive groves. But when you look at this scenery, you bear in mind that you may well be looking at a graveyard, 
beneath those mountain, at the mountain sides, beneath those all of because there are countless graves which to this day have not been dug up. There's, a, there's an attempt to do that now. Oh, the other day you probably noticed, if you were following the television, two days ago, this interesting timing, two days ago, a coffin was carried from a large grave, some, I don't know how many miles, 50 or so miles outside of Madrid, in what is known as the Valle de, de, de los Caídos, the Valley of the Fallen. This is a sinister place. It's a dark place. It's an obscure place, deservedly so, because it conceals a very obscure and dark history. The Valley of the Fallen in, the, in this very somber, dark, mountainous region outside of Madrid, next door to a, an equally sinister looking Catholic uh, monastery in El Escorial, is, is a huge cement cross. I think it's made of cement. It's fast. You can see it for miles and miles and miles. A cross to the fallen, to the martyrs. Yes, not, of course, the communists, anarchists, socialists, republicans, oh no. This is exclusively a fascist monument. And it's still there. 80 years after the end of the conflict, it's still there as an insult, a collective insult to the Spanish people and the memory of the fallen. Oh yes. Now, just think of this. In Germany, in Italy, you will not find any fa fascist monuments. They've been demolished, systematically demolished. They've been destroyed. But there's one country in Europe where this huge, immense fascist monolith still exists. And only after an extreme battle and the resistance of the Roman Catholic Church, which, of course, bear in mind, called Franco's counter-revolution a crusade, and backed it 101%, the, the, the Roman Catholic Church, oh yes, solid support of, for, for the regime for 40 years of this appalling dictatorship. Spain is the only place where the dictator, 40 years after his death, was still in this place being visited as if it were some kind of uh, religious uh, sanctuary. Finally, with the socialist government, they succeeded in getting the, the, the corpse removed to be reburied in some churchyard somewhere in, uh, in Madrid. But what I want to put to you is this. When I say there's a hidden history, don't you believe that it's just hidden from you? It is equally hidden in Spain, or more so. In Spain, 80 years later, this whole period has been blanked out, and particularly the period which I dealt with in this book. The period 40 years ago, so-called democratic transition in Spain, which was, of course, nothing uh, of the kind. This regime, I haven't got time to go into it, it was a, a very brutal regime. Overnight, the Spanish workers found themselves deprived of every single democratic right. No right to strike, no right to have a trade union, no right to assemble, no right to speak, no right to think, no right to, no, no right to worship in the, wish, the, 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 the way that you, you, you wished. Every single right was taken away. And the workers were reduced to a kind of slavery, literal slavery in many cases. This monstrosity in the, the Valle de los Caídos was built by slave labor. Forced labor of Republican and socialist and anarchist prisoners very often worked to death. Many of them died in the process and are buried in un unmarked grave on that, on that particular place. The, car the, the, prison of, the notorious prison of Carabanchel, where prisoners, trade unions in particular, were tortured, shot, garroted. That's a nice, nice little Spanish invention. It's pleasant medieval method of execution, where the prisoner is tied to a stake, something is tied around his neck, and he's strangled from behind. The Garotteville, the last person that died in that manner. I remember it because I was in Barcelona at the time. Was, what was his name? I can't even remember. Pujantich. Pujantich, a young kid, anarchist, opposed to the regime. He was killed in this brutal way. And the old man whose house I was staying at in, in the underground in, the, in Barcelona, he was an old anarchist, a marvelous old man. And almost in tears, he gave me a little tourist keepsake written in Catalan, Deus Guard, God preserve you. And this man had carved very carefully with a knife on this little uh, keepsake, 
the name of Pujan Teach, this martyr of the Spanish youth and the Spanish working class. Now, you see, if you think of all the terrible obstacles, the terrible defeat, and of course, you pay for a defeat. Defeats don't come easily priced. It took a long time to recover from that, that defeat. And under almost unimaginable, I think, I think people in this room, you can't imagine. You can't imagine what it was like. You dare not go and strike or have a demonstration for fear, for fear of your life, in, in effect. And yet, and yet you'd, think, you'd think it was impossible, wouldn't you? You'd think it's all up, it's finished, no more. You know, Ted Grant, my marvellous old friend and uh, teacher and comrade, he used to say to me, you know, in, in ancient mythology, in Greek mythology, there was a giant called Antaeus. This giant struggled with Hercules, and many times Hercules threw him to the ground, and each time you think that the, the, it was finished, this giant was defeated, but every time this giant rose up to continue the battle because he drew strength from his mother, the earth. And Ted says, the working class, our class, is like that giant. You must never forget those words, comrades. I just think, in spite of all these terrible horrors, the Spanish working class did recover under unimaginably difficult conditions. And they launched the biggest unprecedented strike wave in history, I think, of any country in Europe. You will find nothing remotely resembling this, either in Hit Hitler's Germany or in Mussolini's Italy. But in Spain there was, under a fascist dictatorship. Beginning, well, there were strikes before this. There was a big strike in, in Barcelona, I think it was in 1950. There was another strike about that time also in, in Bilbao. But these were more or less isolated incidents. The real fight back began in 1962. I remember it. I remember Ted Grant picking up a copy of the Communist News. I think it was still the Daily Worker at that time. Became the Morning Star. Look at this. Look at this. Strikes in the Asturias, the Asturian coal miners. Now, I know from my own experience that the coal miners are a very special breed. They are. Because of the conditions of work, the danger and so on, it breeds a kind of comradeship and a courage and a militancy you won't find in many other places. So it's no, no, no surprise to me that it began in the Asturias, the glorious Asturian coal miners of 1934 rose up against, again, the threat of fascism and organized the heroic Asturian Commune, October 1934 that was. They were crushed by, by Franco and his moors. This, this is before the Civil War. And these same heroic uh, miners, or the children or the grandchildren, staged this wonderful strike. D despite all the repression, the threats, the danger that they knew that they were in, it didn't make any difference. Once the miners say, that's it, finish, nothing will stop them. And of course, because they lacked trade, there were no trade unions. Trade unions are not allowed, except for the one union. Oh, yes. The vertical trade union, the sindicato, as it was called, the only legal union containing both bosses and, uh, and workers, work it out. You know, they, uh, with, with, in effect, it was, it was a kind of police uh, organization to control the workers, to prevent strikes. Because there were no trade unions, the workers, again, showing enormous creativity, same as the Russian workers in 1905. You know, it wasn't Mar Marx or, 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 Len or Lenin or, or Engels who invented the Soviets. It was the spontaneous creation, the creativity of the Russian workers in 1905, based on their own class instincts and experience. Same in the Asturias. They set they set up what's known as the workers' commissions, elected bodies in each mine and so on and so forth got, got together to lead the strike. And despite the repression, there was repression, of course. Many people were arrested, beaten, and so on and so forth. But nevertheless, the strike movement continued, and it continued every year. The figures are in the book. I, haven't, I don't know them by memory. But they increased by hundreds of thousands, eventually by millions of work workers involved in strikes. There was no, once it started, there was no stopping this marvelous movement. Now, I have to cut the story short, but I can speak to some extent from my personal experience. I first went to Spain in 1972. That was in, in underground conditions. My first underground work was in Barcelona in a, in a working class area called Santa, Santa Coloma de Gramenet. And it was extraordinary. 
to see the militancy, the courage of the young people in particular, young people like yourselves, to get up in the middle of the night with a paintbrush and uh, whatever other implements, paint slogans on the wall, down with the dictatorship, death to Franco, and so on and so forth, you know. The next day, the cops would come and they would paint it over or they'd join up the letters so you couldn't read it. In vain, the next night, the slogans would be back again. And that had every single night, despite the threat of arrest and imprisonment. I remember the first time I attended a May Day demonstration in Spain. It was in May the 1st, 1973. That was in Barcelona. It was a big demonstration, proceeding down the streets with the huge banners at the front. And the roar went up, slogan, Viva la classe obrera, long live the working class. I think that that demonstration, I don't, can't remember if it lasted five minutes or ten, not, not much more than that, because the police sirens would be heard, the cops, when I, when I refer to cops, you guys complain because you, you suffer kettling and stuff like that, or some, some policeman speaks to you in not, in not a very polite fashion or whatever. These are armed police armed with automatic weapons, machine guns. They're there to kill you. They're not there to uh, cattle you or to uh, talk, uh, talk uh, impolitely to you. No, this is serious. So that just scattered. The moment that the cops arrived, the demonstration dissolved. And this happened uh, many, many, many times. Now, Franco died in 1975, in, in November. The regime of Arias Navarro became the prime minister declared national mourning, it was a terrible thing, he appeared in tears on the television, and so on and so forth. Um, it, it, well, uh, how effective that appeal for, for mourning was, I don't know. I do know, because the statistics were there, that uh, there wasn't a single bottle of champagne available in Spain. <laughs> all, all, all the sales of cava sold out. I think that t tells you uh, something about it. I mean, the, the guy I was, a poor old chap, I was staying with this poor old anarchist, very nice man, he did a little dance, this is before the, the death. He would dance in the front, every time. Frank was desperately ill. I think they were keeping, alive, keeping him alive deliberately because they were afraid of the effects if, if his death were announced. And they were quite right about that. <coughs> but um, he did, every time Frank, the report from the hospital came, he did a little dance. You know, came where I am, and came where I came where I I hope he dies before I die. I hope he dies. <laughs> well, his wish was granted. His wish, you see, who says there isn't a God? <laughs> his, wish, his wish was, was granted. And, uh, but, but of course, when Franco died, that really opened up the, uh, that opened up the, uh, the floodgates, the floodgates, and the workers poured through, poured through. Now, just one little observation, because there's a bit of confusion about this. Some people believe, wrongly, that ETA, the, the Basque terrorist organization, played a major role in this uh, movement. That is false. It's entirely false. The role of ETA was marginal, completely. It's a small group, it was marginal. And insofar as they did anything, it was counterproductive. They did have one success, however. Uh, that was, they blew up Fra Franco's second in command, the Admiral Carrero Blanco. That was quite a spectacular operation. Uh, pardon? Wonderful. Wonderful, Anna says. Wonderful. That's revisionism, comrade, you know? <laughs> know. <laughs> well, all right, all right. I will, I will accept that emotionally it was wonderful, yes. In the Basque country, they even invented a little dance with a, 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 throw, throw, with a blanket, throwing a dummy up in the air. You know, up, up goes Carrero Blanco. But uh, yes, it was a, quite amusing in that, but it was very effective. For Christ's sake. This is a dictatorship. They planted a huge bomb in the street, and when the, car, when the admiral's car passed, he was the second in command after Franco. The, it was such a huge explosion, the car ended up on somebody's balcony, you know, somebody had a surprise guest for breakfast, you know. <laughs> He was a little bit overdone, but that's another matter. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, but, yes, but we have to, have to adopt a sober-minded sober attitude towards this. Even when the terrorists succeed, they fail. Because you cannot destroy the state of the capitalist class by killing individuals. You can't do that. You kill one reactionary bastard, he's replaced by another reactionary bastard immediately. And the repression, of course, hits not just the terrorists, it hits the work as it did. They arrested many workers' leaders, were sent to jail, work leaders of the workers' commissions, and so on. So that, that was, didn't really play that much of a role. 
The real role was the working class. And this is spectacular. Now, I've got time to deal with this. There's examples in the book. I quote one particular instance in Pamplona. By the way, here's an interesting example of dialectics. Now, you've all heard of dialectics, of course. And dialectics teaches us that sooner or later, things change into their opposite. Things do change into their opposite. You better, be, better believe it. In the Civil War, the main force that Franco had, his shock troops, if you like, was on the one hand the, the, Moor, the Moors, the Moroccan troops from uh, Morocco, which was a Spanish colony. On the other hand, the, uh, the Red Berets, the uh, Requetés, they were known in, in, in Israel, the Carlists, the Carlista militia. The Carlistas were an ultra-reactionary, ultra-Catholic, ultra-religious, ultra-monarchist, although they supported another pretender to the throne, Don Carlos, hence the name Carlista. But, but at that time, Navarra, Navarra was an extremely backward agricultural province. We're talking about backward peasants here. In order to reward the people of Navarra, Franco poured investments into that area. And it became transformed from a backward rural province to a, a heavily industrialized one. Hence the growth of the working class, a new, fresh, militant working class, like the Russian workers in the, 19, in the 1890s, and throughout the dictatorship, Pamplona was one of the centers, one of the main centers of the Reds, of the, of the revolutionaries. They were the most uh, advanced shock troops, no longer of fascism, shock troops of the revolution. Here's an even more striking example of the dialectics. I said that the Catholic Church, and it's true, the Roman Catholic Church played a, dis a horrible role, a scandalous role of supporting Franco, both in the Civil War and af afterwards. Absolutely criminal edu education and so on and so forth. Yes, but, you know, Jimmy Dean used to say to me, you know, we must learn from the Catholic Church. He said, well, any institution that's been around for 2,000 years and has made the transition from slavery to feudalism to capitalism without any problem and become very rich, you could learn a few tricks from them, and it's true. We shouldn't be ashamed to learn from our enemies. The Catholic, the, the Catholic hierarchy realized that they were in deep trouble. And they were getting reports from the lower orders of the church who were in contact with the workers. They were known as the worker priests. They were ordinary priests, ordinary guys from the seminaries. They could see the, the bad conditions. They could see the low wages. They could see the suffering of the people. And they became radicalized. Many of them, uh, I'll give some examples here of one that I interviewed in detail. He, he gave his experience in the book. You, you, you can learn all about it broke with the church and became revolutionaries. In the case of Navarra, the, uh, the, the priests in Navarra not only broke with the church, not only moved to that, they became Maoists yeah. and set up a, a Maoist trade union, quite a big Maoist trade union, the ORT. You know, mind you, some unkind people said that they swapped one pope for another, but that's a matter of opinion, you know. Mao Zedong instead of the pope. But this was, this, in other words, what I'm describing to you already at that stage is that the foundations of that regime was becoming very, very shaky. And whole layers of the population were becoming, starting with the workers. It was the working class that was the main motor force. There is no question about that. But then, of course, they also, the students were drawn in. Students, young people, are always the most radical elements in society, most open to revolutionaries. That was the case. I'm pointing to Anna, Anna at that time was a student in the Complutense University of Madrid in the sociology department. And she described to me, it's in the book, she described to me how the, the whole university was buzzing, it was electric. Every, am I right on Every single day, mass meetings, illegal mass meetings. You know, students couldn't care, same as the workers couldn't care. Bugger them, leave, let, leave, let them do what they want. Mass meetings, placards, posters, banners, decorating the, the students. Of course, the police, there'd be spies present, of course. The police would soon come, armed police, vicious police. And you could expect a severe beating, at least. And she described to me that she has seen students jump through plate glass windows in order to get away from the police, being cut and ending up in hospital and so on, but uh, terrified of falling into the hands of those, uh, of those forces of repression. But there's nothing, there was no stopping this movement, no stopping it. And it was in that situation that I arrived in Madrid. I went with my family at that time, with my first wife, Pam, who died, unfortunately died recently. 
and two young children. And we uh, set up uh, our home in Madrid in Carabanchel, Carabanchel Alto. That's near the infamous prison where the, where the workers' leaders were held, tortured, shot, garroted, and so on and so forth. I could see the prison from, it doesn't exist anymore, they demolished it. I could, that was also built by slave labor. I could see that from, from one of the windows of my, of, of my flat. But when I arrived in Madrid, this is January 1976, the whole place was, was on strike. Madrid was in a general strike. Everybody, the postal workers, the metro workers, the train workers, the car workers, every sector was on strike. I had a little experience that when I arrived, I was sending reports back to the militant newspaper, some of which are, 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 are reprinted in the book because they give a genuine eyewitness account, a flavor of the events. I went to post one of these reports. I went to the post office and I will never forget the response of the chap behind the counter. I said, can I post this to, 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 to Britain? He said, well, you can. He said, but it won't get there. I said, why not? He said, because they're on strike. And he, he, you can see his face was bleeped. He was, <laughs> he was beaming because they're on strike. He said, and he was, so, he was so pleased. The whole of Madrid was on strike. And that was typical. The whole of Spain was moving in, in that direction. That was in uh, January 1976. And actually that, there were a number of peaks to this movement. You know, the movement, the workers' movement moves up and up and down, of course. But one of the key developments took place on the 3rd of March of that year. That was a fat fateful year, 1976, 3rd of March. Now, if I say to you, the 3rd of March, Vittoria, how would you react? I think you'd, you'd be a bit puzzled. What is this? What's the 3rd of March? And it's a tragedy that today, even today in Spain, that's why I say, they've silenced the whole thing. They've tried to bury it such that people don't remember. Spain has been subjected for 40 years to what I would describe as forced collective amnesia. Forget, 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 forgive and forget, you know. And they've tried to eradicate this. Never, in spite of that fact, the 3rd of March, I think, in Spain, among, among activists, certainly it means quite a lot, but among most people, maybe not. That was a, a turning point. Now, in general, the parties, the only two parties that counted, in, only one party really counted in Spain. There were many parties, many left parties, all illegal. But it was the Communist Party that undoubtedly had a crushing superiority particularly among the workers and in the factories in the union. No question about that at all. The Socialist Party was far weaker. We were more, more in contact with the Socialist Party through our work in the Labour Party, through the militant at that time. And then there were many other smaller left groups. They, they counted for, for, for a, good few, a good few thousand, however, in underground conditions. But the Communist Party actually exercised, how shall I say, a paralyzing role. The leaders of the Communist Party had no desire whatsoever for a revolution in Spain. None. On the contrary. What they were striving for and had been striving for from the very beginning, but as early as the 1950s, when they launched in exile in Moscow, the so-called Freedom Pact, the Pacto per la Libertad. The idea was to do a deal with the regime, or rather with the left, the progressive elements of the regime, in order to reach some kind of a compromise, you see. No question of socialism, no question of revolution, no question of workers' power. And they played a paralyzing role. But the Communist Party had no base whatsoever, or very little base anyway, in Alava, in, in, the, in the Basque province of Alava, capital of that is Vitoria, the town of Vitoria, industrial town. There was a mass strike taking place in Vitoria, beginning in, I think, December of the previous year. It was continuing right through 1976. And it culminated in a general strike in, on the 3rd of March, 1976. Now, I went there, of course, in order to try to build this, organ, this tendency, which we succeeded in doing, by the way. But that's a separate story. But we were in contact with the leaders of the Socialist Union and the Young Socialists in Vitoria. But in the middle of this huge movement, they didn't have anything. They didn't have even a duplicator to, to, print, to print leaflets and so on. So, the Comrades uh, pressurized the trade union bureaucracy, the UGT bureaucracy in Madrid, to give us a, a small duplicate to take to help the Comrades in, in Oliver. 
But they kept us waiting. There was a car full, full of young socialists and myself. They kept us waiting, uh, and that's a bad thing. Because in the underground, you do not arrive late. Shouldn't arrive late anyway. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, don't make a habit of coming late, comrades. It's a bad habit, you know. Turn up on time. It's a good policy. But in the underground, it's not just a good, good idea. It's an absolute necessity, because you can get into serious trouble by coming late. They kept us... And we didn't arrive until, uh, until 1 o'clock in the morning to uh, Victoria, which was an armed camp. The regime concentrated the police, the, uh, the civil guard, and so on. All the repressive forces were, were concentrated. We were nearly arrested on the way in. Should I give the reason for it? Should I? Well, it's a small thing. It's a tragedy when a, a dear friend of mine and a dear comrade and a very important revolutionary leader, Alberto Arregui, died this January, in January, suddenly. I was with him in Christmas. He was supposed to come and visit Andrew and myself in March, and he dropped dead of a heart attack. But I never realized Alberto, he, he had, he was, now he was one of the leaders of the United Left in Spain. At that time, I didn't realize that he had, a, had an artificial leg. He dissimulated it quite well. He lost his leg in a train accident as, as a child. But the, the duplicator was put in the passenger seat, covered in a blanket, and to make his, to allow himself a little bit of leg room to move, he put his artificial leg on top. I didn't realize yet. I said, good God, what's that? <laughs> I didn't know. That artificial leg saved our life. Because as we were driving into uh, Vitoria, we were stopped by the, the police. An armed cop came up, looked inside, suspiciously. I remember exactly the words he said. Where have you come from? The driver said uh, as, as nonchalantly as he could, um, from Madrid. It must have been only a few seconds, but it seemed like hours. The chap was looking into the car. Then suddenly his eyes fixed upon this artificial leg, and he said, oh, okay, uh, drive on. <laughs> so we did. So that, 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 that's the story of the artificial leg. And we got inside, we got inside of this, uh, this city, which was an armed camp. In the book, I carried the report which I sent to the militant of that, that day. It was, it was an enormous experience. Now, these workers, not under the influence of the Stalinists or the reformers, set up their own representative committees, elected the Soviets. I think that's the only time in, our, in my life I can say that I attended a meeting of a Soviet where, well, in Victoria, of course, but where in Victoria? Where could you meet? Where could you have a meeting of several thousand people? There's only one place you could meet. That was in a cathedral, in a church. Oh, yes. We had our meetings and congresses and central committees and churches and monasteries, the only places that the police couldn't, uh, normally couldn't intervene. It was supposed to be not, permit, not permitted. And by that time, there were such, such cracks opening up in the church that very often the local priests were quite friendly or at least neutral. They would let you use their uh, premises. And this was... A very important thing. So the Church of San Francisco is a big church. There were several thousand people inside that church. Men, women, and children. This is the day before the general. So it must have been on the 2nd of, of May. Now, you know, I, I, I know Spain very well. I know its people. I know their character. I love Spain. I love the Spanish people. I love their character. But they've got one slight defect, you know. I don't take offense at what I say if there's any Spanish communists present. They are rather noisy. <laughs> Not as noisy as the Italians, however. <laughs> but they are slightly... And normally a, Span a meeting of that character would be difficult to control. You'd have people interrupting and shouting and demanding the right to speak. No, 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 no. This was different. You could hear a pin drop. Absolute silence, absolute discipline. And from the platform, I've never heard such revolutionary speeches. Marvellous speeches. I wish, I, I, I wish I'd have had a tape recorder. I didn't have such a thing. These guys were not talking about wage increases or anything like that. They were talking about revolution and workers' power. The power belongs to the working class. We create all the wealth. We must take the power. People, every, everyone agreed. Men, women, old people, and so on. Coloss I remember this one, one woman stood up, ordinary working class housewife, and she said, well... If I have to tell my children there's only dry bread to eat, I will tell them, eat your bread, because we've got to win this strike, no matter what. That was the mood that existed, colossal, courageous mood of the working class. 
The following day there were demonstrations. The, the, the workers marched with great discipline in platoons from the factories in the outlying districts to the centre of Victoria, where there was like a cat and, cat and mouse game all, all day long. The cops would come hoping to beat people up, the, the workers would disperse, then they would re, re, reassemble and this game went on all day. Actually, the, the police were going crazy. That was evident. Now, it, it, tea time, we had to leave because we had another meeting in Pamplona. We assumed that the strike is finished. It was all over. There was another meeting held at the same church the following night, the following evening. At about six o'clock, the church, the police were there, but they allowed people to go into the church. They didn't stop people from going into the church. And when the church was absolutely full, I repeat, men, women, and children, they surrounded the church and they lobbed tear gas and smoke canisters through the windows. People inside was terrified that there was like an, an explosion, they could hear explosions. The gas canisters hit the floor and the, the, the whole building was, was, was full of smoke and tear gas. People couldn't breathe. People were suffocating. And as the people struggled to get through the doors to get out of the church, the police opened fire with automatic weapons. They killed five people and wounded hundreds. It was a massacre. And that event in itself would have been sufficient to call an all-out general strike throughout Spain. It, it caused an impact, a tremendous uh, effect, but that call never came on the contrary. The Communist Party did its level best to conceal what was happening, to hide what was happening, to prevent any movement whatsoever. And that was the general tactic. That was what, what was proceeding. The struggle continued, despite the, 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 the leaders trying to stop it, it, it continued. In January 1977, that was another turning point, another turning point. I hope Anna doesn't uh, mind if I mention uh, something that affected her personally. In the university, there was a young girl from a, a working class family, Marie Luth, Ma Ma Marie Luth, yes, a beautiful young girl, never been on the demonstration. She went to Anna and says, will you take me to the demonstration? This was quite close to Anna. Are you sure you wanted to go? Yes, she agreed. Took, took this young girl to the demonstration. The police, of course, attacked viciously. By the way, the purpose of this demonstration was to protest the murder of another student. Ar Ar Arturo Ruiz was murdered shortly uh, pre previous to, to this, the day before, as Anna reminds me. The police attacked with their usual vicious, uh, and this is real vicious stuff. Now, even at that time in Spain, it was f f supposed to be illegal to shoot a gas canister, a canister direct at, at somebody. It's supposed to sh shoot it into the air, it falls down the gas, then does the work. This is a lethal weapon if it's aimed at somebody's head. Now in, in, in the chaos that of, of, the, of the dispersal, Anna lost contact with this young girl, didn't know anything about it. Subsequently she learned that a young girl had been killed on this demonstration, and it was the same, Mary Luth. Some bastard pol policeman aimed directly at her head and fired a tear gun, it had exploded, killing th this young girl. There's still, to this day, the family work, still have ceremonies to, to, uh, to, to mark this terrible event. What happened to that policeman? Nothing happened to him. The same as nothing happened to any of these torturers and murderers. For 40 years, nothing has happened. And that's the great crime. That's the point they're coming to. You see, that sad incident, that tragic incident, was in a way it was overshadowed by an even more, you could say, if it's possible to say, even, even a greater tragedy. In the Calle de Atocha in Madrid, center of Madrid, there was the officer, the office of labor lawyers, uh, they, they actually were members of the Communist Party, uh, and they were defending workers that had got into difficulty with the law and so on and so forth. A gang of fascists turned up, armed fascists turned up, with the, burst into the uh, headquarters, lined up these uh, lawyers against the wall and shot five of them dead. And there was another, a worker, who was in the wrong place at the wrong time. I spoke to his brother, I interviewed him for the, for the, for the book. But that murder of the Atocha murders, it really caused an a, 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 a explosion. I'll never forget, uh, uh, that day I came down from the flat in Carabanchel 
And there was a man, his name was Felipe, he was from the Asturias, he was uh, a porter, you know, a caretaker. And he was cleaning the floor with his uh, broom, primitive broom. I said, uh, Felipe, have you, have you heard the news? Now, these porters are politically backward people. Many of them work for the police as informers. This was known. I never forget. This man must have been an Andalus, I think, from the south anyway. I can see the look of absolute rage on his face. He picked up his broom as if it was a weapon. He said, if I could get my hands on those bastards, I would kill them. And this was general. This was, there was a, a rage, an explosive mood existed. One word from the Communist Party in particular, there would have been a general strike in Spain. It would have been the end of things, I can assure you. There's no question of it. Yes, but that word never came. Santiago Carrillo, the leader of the, of the Communist Party, who had been surreptitiously allowed to return from exile and was inside Spain, although theoretically he was illegal, made statements in the press interview, interview the press, saying, we must support the government. We must be responsible. We must show that we're responsible. We, that was he said. Those were the, his precise words. We must support the government at this time. This was the... Uh, the argument. In the funeral of, of, the, of the lawyers, which happened the next day, they don't waste any time in Spain with funerals, it turned into a mass demonstration. You never, never, I don't know how many people were on the streets, how many, a million, I can't, I can't imagine. A huge, huge demonstration, yes, but no slogans allowed, no chanting allowed, no flags, no banners, nothing. You walk in silence. So hundreds of thousands of workers had to file through the streets choking on their anger, choking on because of the word came from the Communist Party. And there was a reason for that. Santiago Carrillo was not interested in what the workers thought about this. He was interested in the new man that had taken over the government, Adolfo Suarez. And the king, the king of Spain who was behind him. Now, of course, Spain had not been uh, a monarchy. Since 1931, since they kicked out uh, King Alfonso, it wasn't a, even under Franco. Even the fascists didn't dare to restore. They didn't want to restore the monarchy, and Franco was quite happy holding power, so he didn't want a monarch either. But when he died, he appointed the grandson actually of the old king, although his son was still alive. So therefore, I won't bore you with uh, monarchical uh, niceties. But even from a monarchical point of view, the Juan, Juan Carlos had no right to be the king of Spain. His father, who was in Portugal, should have been the king, actually. But his father didn't get on with Franco. Franco, pay attention to what I'm saying. Franco n named Juan Carlos as the king of Spain and his successor when he died. Okay? Now, listen carefully to what I'm about to say. That is the only legitimacy, the only legitimacy that the Spanish monarchy has ever had. That it was nominated by the dictator Franco. It has no other legitimacy. Zero. There was never a referendum. It was never agreed. But it was imposed upon the Spanish people. How was it imposed? I will come to that in a moment. Adolfo Suarez, the new prime minister. Quite a smart man, I must say. Well, he's not, not uh, profound, but, but clever, smart trickster, and so on. What was, what was, who was Adolfo Suarez? Adolfo Suarez previously had been the general secretary of El Movimiento. El Movimiento, the movement, is the only, was the only political party in, in, in Franco Spain. And he was the general secretary. That is his democratic credentials. Never fought against the dictators, never fought for democracy. His, his, his democratic record is nil, zero, zilch. And this is the man that Santiago Carrillo and Felipe González, the leader of the Socialist Party, who, by the way, organized my first trip to Spain, but that's another matter. I'm, I'm, I'm ashamed to mention that. <laughs> I'm, only, I'm only joking. Anyway, so that is the man that he wanted to do a deal with. And he did. They entered into discussions, particularly after this business in 1977. They entered into conversations in which Suarez was completely astonished. I'm convinced he was astonished. Here is this notorious communist from Moscow, this red, this revolutionary, this dangerous man. And 
he's smoking and talking quite uh, quite naturally and like like a, like a friend that he uh, uh, that he that he's been friends all his life with with Suarez. And there's one detail that the Suarez pick, kept picked up on. This communist leader, I suppose, obviously he must be an atheist, was continually saying, "Thank God, God be praised," and so "Thank God for this, thank God for that." Suarez couldn't believe. He was trying to impress Suarez as how moderate he was. What a nice man he was. Not really a communist at all, which is true. He wasn't. Oh, can you not hear me? Can you hear me now? Should have said so before. You shy or what? Can you hear me at the back? Yes, they can hear at the back. Can't hear me on the front. They, they negotiated. And Swarov, what did, what did Carillo want? He wanted the CP to be legalized. Full stop. The Communist Party must be legalized. Swarov said, well, you know, that's rather difficult, old chap. You know, it's, uh, you know, a lot of people would uh, be very hostile to that. There will have to be conditions. He said, what conditions are they? Well, first of all, accept the monarchy. Now, you must understand. I remember. Anna will remember. Dara will remember. At that time, nobody in Spain supported the monarchy. Nobody. It was anathema. Who ever heard of this? Absolutely. If there was one principle, one fundamental principle of the, of, of the democratic movement, if you like, is that they were Republicans, at least. That was a fact. Yes, yes. So, so, so what, what was Carillo's point? Yes, yes, that's okay. What's the next point? Oh, smart was surprised. You must accept the national flag, Franco's flag, the flag of a million dead. Oh, yes, that's all right. I said, are you sure? Oh, yeah, that'll be okay. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, don't worry about that. So, uh, you must prohibit the, 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 the Republican flag must not be seen in any communist public meeting. Yeah, but, uh, don't worry. Yeah, we'll take care of that. Yeah. And Swara at, at this time was becoming a bit suspicious. He said, look, are you sure you can convince your, your comrades uh, of this? He said, don't worry about my comrades. I'll take care of them, which he did, you know. All these things. Oh, and a few other little points. No, no one is to be put on trial for crimes committed under the regime. Everything is to be forgiven and forgotten and amnestied and all the rest of it. These questions must not be raised. Oh, yes, and the state apparatus must remain as it was. No general is to be removed. No police chief is to be removed. They're all to be the, the same state apparatus. Yes. Santiago Carrillo agreed to all these things. Now, you, could, you would expect a certain amount of resistance, wouldn't you, from the cop? But Santiago Carrillo was quite a... He knew. He knew his comrades. He knew his Stalinist party. He knew some people in this room, we've got Comrade Jim Brooks at the back, perhaps would, would, would understand what I'm trying to say. That many of these people, I mean, someone like Carrillo, he's been in Moscow, he's, been, he's a big man, he's the leader, and so on. And the, the argument would be this, oh yes, don't worry, comrades, it's only a tactic. It's only a tactic, you know. We just say in this in public and we'll be all right, just, 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 just leave it to us. Just, but the leaders know best, you know, and the, the workers would, would not be happy, but they'd be distinctly very unhappy about it. Especially when they try to stop strikes, which they did. They give orders. No more strikes, no more, calm things down, and so on and so forth. There was resistance. There was resentment. But at the end of the day, what are you supposed to do? As a disciplined, loyal communist, you're going to say, okay, yeah, the leaders know best. Leave it, leave it that. And that's what occurred. That's what occurred. Now, this was, the name of the book is not an accident. The Great Betrayal. This was the Great Betrayal. You can't think of any other name. I thought of other names for it. No, 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 no. There's only one possible name. When you think of the tremendous sacrifices of people, people gave their lives in the fight for democracy, never mind about uh, socialism. And it was all thrown away. The, sign of a, uh, the signing of a, a bit of paper. By Carillo, and of course, there's no difference between him and Gonzalez. They were the same. Felipe Gonzalez was no, the leader of the Socialist Party. Absolutely no different to that. What occurred? Now look, I think you realize I've been in this movement for many years. I first joined in this organization, that is to say, in, uh, what's that say? You lion. <laughs> All right. You see, I'll be disciplined. Uh, 
I joined this organization in 1960 when I was 16 years of age, when I was uh, young and handsome <laughs> and, uh, and thin like you guys. You know, you, you know what I mean? Dara will remember. Dara, was I thin? There we are, you see. Dara says I was thin, I was thin, all right? <laughs> yeah, but what I'm saying is this. I've seen all, in my life, I've seen all kinds of situations. I've seen all kinds. I've seen good situations, I've seen bad situations. I've seen victories, I've seen defeats. I've seen euphoria and I've seen despair. And we have to learn how to deal with those situations. You must not be carried away either by too much euphoria or by too much uh, depression. We have to learn, you know, in the words of the great uh, philosopher Spinoza that Trotsky liked to quote, neither to weep nor to laugh, but to understand. That's the question. Neither weep nor laugh, but try, try to understand what is, what is uh, occurring. Yeah, I've seen all kinds of situations, but I'll tell you this. I've never in my life, either before or since, witnessed such colossal demoralization as what I saw in 1978, 79, 80. When the rank-and-file workers, communists and socialists, began to understand what was happening, in communist, dem uh, dem uh, communist uh, public meetings, they were big, they were allowed. The Communist Party was legalized. That's all, was, that's all that... Uh, Santiago Carrillo was interested in. When young people came with Republican flags, they were beaten up, savagely beaten up by Communist Party stewards, and the flags were, were confiscated or destroyed. When people saw this and they realized what was occurring, then there was a colossal collapse of morale, colossal demoralization. People were leaving the party, the Communist Party in particular, also the Socialist Party, left, right, and center, tearing up their cards. There, was one, I, there were many tragic cases, but I'll quote one as a particularly tragic case. I said earlier, I pointed out to you, that Pamplona passed from being a, a bastion of Franco reaction in the Civil War to be a bastion of the red proletariat in the period which I'm describing. At that time, we had, there was an old comrade who joined us his name was Raphael, Rafa is for short. He was an old man, I think he was in his, probably in his 70s. Raphael had in his pocket the number one membership card of the Socialist Party of Navarra and the one, number one membership card of the Socialist Trade Union in Navarra, the UGT. One day, uh, he was also, yes, he was also the, the president of the Casa del Pueblo, the People's House, that was like a, a place that workers would come to meet and discuss and to play chess or whatever. He was the president. He was a man with a long history. One day, without saying anything to, to us, he walked into the headquarters of the Socialist Party. He took out his uh, party card, placed it on the table, Without saying a word, he turned around and walked out. He then went to the, the Socialist Trade Union, the UGT, took out his UGT card, number one, placed it on the table, and with great proletarian dignity, turned around without saying a word, and he walked out. Do you know what that means? You know what these things are? These are not scraps of paper. This was the man's whole life that he'd sacrificed and struggled and worked for all his life, for decades, facing repression and imprisonment and all the other horrors. Gone. Like that. And like Raphael, there were many cases. Thousands all over Spain. People just left. The collapsed. The movement collapsed. The strikes went down. The demonstrations went down. And of course, the opportunists, the careerists, of course, they were in the, having a field day. People were, people were queuing up to join the Socialist Party in particular, the Communist Party also at that time, but on an opportunist basis. Not people joining to struggle, to change society, people looking for a job, a parliamentary position, an MP, you know, I think you know the type. We've met them, we've met them haven't we? And that was the end of it really. 
They passed a constitution. It, it was put to a referendum. It was passed, of course. Yeah, why? Well, because at that stage, people could see no other alternative. It was either, that was the propaganda, either this or nothing. You want a dictatorship? You want freedom? You want, do you want to vote in elections? People said, yes, I want to vote in, in elections. Yes, but that was the end of the Communist Party. They thought they were so smart, so clever, they, they were not. Incidentally, by doing what they did, the pendulum in Spain swung sharply to the right, of course, of course. It swung from the far to the left to far to the, the right. And that expressed itself inevitably in the growth of reactionary forces. They did not purge the state. To, to this day, that's the case. And what occurred? In February, what is it, 23, no? 23, the 23rd of, of February, 1981. Uh, I remember I was in our headquarters in Madrid. We were, the executive was meeting in one room. The print shop workers were working uh, to produce the, the, the newspaper, clearly that. One of them came in and said, uh, the parliament was meeting to elect a new government, to appoint a new head of state. They came in and said, there's uh, shots being fired in the parliament. We gathered on the radio, the radio was silent. We thought, well, one of two things. Either it's a terrorist attack or it's a coup. We'll know in, we'll know in five minutes, we'll know soon enough. So we waited, there was still no news. He said, okay, it's a coup. So we clean all the stuff out of the center, we scattered to safe addresses all over mid, and we agreed to meet again at a, at a safe venue in the early hours of the morning. Now, I was firmly convinced at the time that the king himself was behind this coup. Juan Carlos was, I was convinced of it. I said so, I wrote articles to that effect. And yet, you see, at about, in the early hours of the morning, the king came on the screen of the television saying, making a very peculiar speech, saying all units are to remain at their place and stay there until further orders. That's all he said. He didn't condemn the coup, he didn't say. Yes, he didn't condemn it because he was behind it. And yet, immediately the day, by the way, there were mass demonstrations on the streets after that. But the, immediately, Carillo and Gonzalez came out to praise the king. He saved democracy. He's the savior of Spanish democracy. The complete opposite of the truth. And for 40 years, these lies have been maintained. 40 years, people have been fed on these lies in Spain and internationally. Except that now, at last, things are beginning to emerge. Things are beginning to emerge which prove conclusively what I said at the time. That Juan Carlos was behind this coup. There's no, no two ways about it. His private secretary published his memoir shortly before he died. He maintained silence all these years. He spilt the beans. And it's quite a damning stuff, but I haven't got time to read it, but it's in the book. Now, we've got an iron chairman here tonight. I'm pleased to see. Tovazis Gilnetsky. That is, uh, you can't see this, but he's kicking me under the table. <laughs> I will report you to the Control Commission. <laughs> but uh, no, seriously, we, 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 must draw, we must draw the threads together. You see, history for us is not something that's meaningless, like these idiots in the universe, these postmodernist morons. You know, they say the history has got no meaning. History has a meaning. And you know, it was the, the American philosopher, uh, Santayana, who said, he who does not learn from history will forever be doomed to repeat it. Commonly, we don't want to repeat history. We must not repeat history. And therefore, it is an obligation on our shoulders to study carefully the history, particularly of revolutions and the class struggle, of victory and of uh, defeat. That's the purpose of this. Now, to this very day, to this very day, the people of Spain are paying the bill for this betrayal. Look what's happening in Catalonia now. Part of the betrayal was the refusal to accept the right of self-determination of the Catalans and the Basque. Now you see the consequence. It's like civil war. It's, 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 and that means, of course, that the old monsters have not been laid to rest. They tried to bury it. They tried to make people forget it. But people do not forget. How can people forget? When the old judges, the old uh, generals, the old bureaucrats are still in their place, as they were before, just decorated with a little bit of a pseudo facade of so-called so -called democracy. The former torturers walk, walk in the streets to this day. There was a man 
I remember this person. I've never met him, fortunately. Anna will remember him well. Also, you didn't meet him, did you, when you were in the, the, the prison? No, you didn't, didn't meet him in the dungeons. Called Billy the Kid. Oh, yeah, B Billy El Nino. Sounds like a joke. It's no joke. This man was a, a vicious torturer and sadist who delighted in inflicting pain to the nth degree on his uh, victims. This man was never prosecuted for his crimes because he's not allowed. You were not allowed. Even, look, even in South Africa, we had a miserable betrayal took place also. But even there, you had the so-called truth, what's it called? Truth commissions. People are supposed to tell the truth. In Spain, you try and tell the truth about the, the past, you, you'll go to jail. It's a criminal offense. People have, have gone to jail for this, for trying to tell the truth. Billy El Nino was not only not arrested, not only imprisoned, he was promoted. He just had his pension increased. And the, the attempts by his victims to bring this man to trial have been thrown out of court. Not allowed by this wonderful democratic constitution of ours. By the uh, democratic transition. Now I want to finish one on a positive note. I'm a Marxist and therefore positive and optimistic by nature. Marxism does not allow us to be the, the luxury of being pessimists under any circumstances. You see, there's a new generation now in Spain. There's a new generation coming forth. Coming for. It reminds me, in a way, I, I must give this little incident. In 1940, when Hitler's army marched into Paris, there was a conversation between a German officer and a French officer, the defeated French. German officer, of course, was arrogant and swaggering and so on. And the French officer said, yes, my friend, yes, it's true. The wheel of history has turned. It will turn again, he said. It will turn again. And it did, of course, it did turn again. Same is true of revolutions. We had the experience. We've had 40 years of deceit and uh, a terrible cover-up, if you like. But the, the wheel of history has, has turned. Now in Spain you see huge movement, move, movements of the women on the 8th of March, colossal mass demonstrations, marvelous. <laughs> movements of the pensioners, which I certainly didn't, uh, didn't expect that. And on these mass demonstrations of pensioners against pensioners, there are many of the old faces. People that were active at that time have come back to life and are also joining, joining the struggle. But above all, it's the youth. The youth of Spain are no longer prepared to live with a lie. They want the truth. They demand the truth. That's why there's this a colossal movement is, is, is developing. To dig up the corpses, to discover the, where people have been killed, and to, to tell the truth about th this, uh, this monstrosity. And it's in this context that our organization has a role to play. And I would like to think, in a, mod a modest way, in a small modest way, that this book which I have written, but it's not just me, it's other comments, Anna and many other comments. This is, the, this is our, the li what we saw, what we, what we lived through. And in writing this book, I can say that my, my intention was, I don't know whether I succeeded, I, I was intending that anyone who reads this book, it shouldn't just be a dry relation, a narrative of the facts, should have feel as if they've lived through these events and experiences themselves. It was, comrades, a marvelous revolution. I, to this day, I'm proud of the fact that, uh, that I, I had the honor of living through these great events and witnessing the potential of our class. That memory will still stay with me till the day I die. And above all, we must struggle to ensure that that unfinished revolution, because that's what it was, will eventually be carried to a successful conclusion. Comrades, that depends on one thing and one thing alone. Our ability to build the IMT, to build our forces of revolutionary Marxism in Britain, in Spain, and on a world scale. Comrades, forward to the victory of the International Socialist Revolution.